Welcome to the Carter G. Woodson Lecture. The Carter G. Woodson was an American historian, author, journalist, and the founder of the Association for the Study of African American Life and History. He was one of the first scholars to study the history of the African diaspora, including African American history. Carter G. Woodson is known as the father of Black history, and we honor him and celebrate his legacy by having Dr. Earl Bolden present on Resilient Joy, which speaks to not only the reality of people who encountered much and persevered, but were able to thrive in an inequitable world collectively. Dr. Earl Bolden is the Interim Associate Provost and Associate Vice President for Academic Affairs at Coppin State University in Baltimore, Maryland. He also serves part-time as a senior lecturer at the Cave Hill campus of the University of the West Indies and as a visiting professor at Addis Ababa University in Ethiopia. Dr. Bolden has over 25 years of experience as a macro social work educator and practitioner. His research agenda focuses on the community and organizational capacity building, university and community partnerships, faith-based community development, the globalization of higher education, disengaged dads, and the disengaging of males in the academy. I introduce to you Dr. Earl, Earl Bolden. Thank you so very much, Dr. Savoy. Colleagues in the academy and others, good afternoon. Thank you for taking time out of your schedule to join uh, me today for this lecture. It feels a little different being on this side, um, especially seeing for the past 10 years or so, I've been the one organizing these efforts. So it feels a little different, but it feels good to have, had the, to have the opportunity to present. So I want to thank the committee for the invitation. Most of you are online, but we have a few that are joining us, including uh, my provost and a couple of my colleagues. So I want to um, recognize the presence of my provost and vice president for academic affairs, Dr. Wilkes. Now, I'm so glad to present to you on a topic that some of you may say, OK, resilient joy, what exactly is that? But for a few minutes, I'm going to try to break this down and take you on a journey where it would be clear exactly what I mean by resilient joy. But first, allow me to share with you a few words that I penned um, a couple of years ago that speaks to the issue of resiliency. I've faced tremendous risk and challenges, but like a brand new penny, I shine. I've faced the elements, the sunshine and the rain, hurricanes and tornadoes. And although I have been tarnished, I still shine. I've been tossed aside and undervalued, labeled as inconvenient weight. Yet, in the darkest of all moments, I shine. I've been buried in the mud, but the mud became my protector from those who could not see my worth. But a day of reckoning always comes when what was hidden is revealed a day when absence makes the heart grow fonder. A day when hope and faith produce victory. A day when I will shine. So, don't give in to hope that was dashed or dreams interrupted by greed and fame. At the end of the day, Remember the penny that still looks brand new because it did more than merely survive. And in the end of it all, I will live fully. I will live well. As I rebound, I am more resourceful and strengthened through adversities. And like the penny, I shine. 
As I dissect the theme resilient joy, let's first look at the concept of resilience as depicted by the life of the man in whom, after whom this lecture is named. I speak of none other than Dr. Carter G. Woodson. Let me, if you will, share an excerpt from Thomas Claiborne the fourth. On February of 1926, a man named Carter Goodwin Woodson launched a celebration of Negro History Week, now known as Black History Month. The father of commem commemorating Black History Month was born on December 19, 1875 in Canton, Virginia, and passed away on April 3rd, 1950. In this excerpt, Claiborne reflected on Woodson's life to pick up on personal resilience tips. Woodson was the son of former slaves, Annie Eliza, better known as Riddle, and James Henry Woodson. His player, parents were both illiterate, and his father, who helped the Union soldiers during the Civil War, supported the family as a carpenter and farmer. The Woodson family was impoverished, but proud. The happiest day of their lives was when they became free. Carter was often unable to attend primary school regularly because he needed to help out on the farm. Furthermore, he had to put off additional schooling while working on coal mines in West Virginia. Talk about adverse childhood experiences. Carter graduated from Berea College and became a teacher and school administrator. He earned the graduate degrees from the University of Chicago and in 1912 was the second African American after W. E. Du Bois to obtain a PhD from Harvard University. Carter spent most of his academic career at Howard University, my alma mater, incidentally, a historically black university in Washington, DC, where he eventually served as Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences. Carter had a vision of creating an institutional structure that would make it possible for black scholars to study history. Although he had a clear vision, he lacked funds, so he took it upon himself to invite investors to participate with his idea. These are some of the things he did. He collected nickels and dimes from kids in Sunday school. But eventually he was able to get big checks from philanthropists. Claiborne's excerpt ended with the statement that all in all, because of one man's resilience, we all have a more enriched pathway. Carter G. Woodson believed that the only way to achieve racial equality was through the study of and elevation of black excellence. May I suggest to you that whether we clearly recognize it or not, the excellence of which he spoke is rooted in resilience. For no matter what our chosen profession is, whether non-professional, paraprofessional, or professional, our journey towards our excellence will be wrought with challenges and naysayers from various camps. 
Consequently, a resilient spirit is essential. Each phase of our de development should lead to a freedom that takes us to a more joyous place. In preparing this lecture, I imagine Carter G. Woodson having three questions he might ask or issues he, cho he might choose to confront. As a scholar, I imagine he would be concerned about why the study of an articulation of what happened in our past poses such a threat to primarily those who currently make up the majority race. And I said currently on purpose. I imagine that he would expound on whether the past truly is the past if it still lingers in the present. Secondly, I imagine that he would want to define black excellence more clearly. What is it? Who owns it? Who protects it? Who benefits from it? Thirdly, he might very well ponder why the elevation of the excellence of blacks in America poses such a threat to others. Why do others seek to block or claim that excellence as their own? Why do so many still seek to, and I sadly say, succeed in claiming that excellence as their own? This discourse does not end here. I see him, Dr. Woodson, as an advocate for radical self-love as advanced by Sonia Renee Taylor in The Body Is Not an Apology. I love that too. Here she notes that radical self-love self demands that we see ourselves and others in the fullness of our complexities and intersections and that we work to create space for those intersections. May I suggest to you that we ought not to allow ourselves to fall into the trap that so many do by thinking that our narrative can be captured by a single story. That is a mistake too many of us make. Furthermore, picture a level of curiosity about concepts such as joyous resilience and joyous activism. These are new terms that I became familiar with as I was preparing this lecture for you today. Joyous resilience, Anjali Sherwin noted, is the magical powerful force that emanates from an inner locus of nurturance, protection and emotional attunement. Resilience, she suggested, is the ability to withstand, stand back from stress and trauma, and allow us to, be, to reestablish contact with an inner joy so we can thrive. Joyous activism refers to any activity that attempts to make changes in society to advance social, political, economic, and environmental reform with the aim of enhancing joy and resilience for all. It can include participating in rallies or marches to defund the police, to support or supporting black lives or opposing climate change, petitioning by writing or calling our politicians to address topics of concern. It would, might also involve creating art such as murals, film, dance, or poetry that brings an awareness to pressing issues of our times. And I want to, to share with you a book that is written and produced 
by one of our local artists. And the title of this book is Art Activism, the Revolutionary Art, Poetry and Reflections of Aaron Mabin. He's local to Baltimore City, but I would encourage all of you to see about getting a copy. He captures some of the relevant issues of the day in poetry form. He sometimes draws his um, art or takes pictures of murals that he created or that are in the city, but powerfully captures issues of concern. Allow me at this time to share with you a few characteristics of resilience as highlighted by individuals from various walks of life and backgrounds. First one I want to share with you is confidence. Without confidence, you are twice defeated in the race of life. These words were eloquently stated by none other than Marcus Garvey, historical icon and black activist. Next, I want to take you to the space where we focus on internal locus of control and a statement that I want to highlight here says, I am not what happened to me. Let me repeat that. I am not what happened to me. I am what I choose to become. And this is not a um, word. These words were advanced by Carl Young or John, people pronounce it Carl J-U-N-G. For those of you who may have a different pronunciation who is a Swiss psychiatrist. The next characteristic I want to highlight is that of strong self-worth. And these words were captured by Malcolm Forbes, the publisher of Forbes magazines. And he said, too many people overhaul, overvalue what they're not and undervalue what they are. Let me repeat that. Too many people overvalue what they're not and undervalue what they are. Powerful words. Think about it. The next characteristic I would like to share with you is perseverance and grit. And these words came from Victor Frank, an Austrian psychiatrist, and he simply said this, what is to give light must endure burning. What is to give light must endure burning. I'm gonna leave you to think about that. Yeah. Next characteristic is progressive or growth mindset. And before I tell you who, say, who said these words, I'm sure many of you will figure this out. It simply says, if you can't fly, then run. If you can't run, then walk. If you can't walk, then crawl. But whatever you do, keep moving forward. Whatever you do, keep moving forward. And in case, just in case, some of you forgot who said these simple but powerful words, it's none other than Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., or American Baptist preacher, minister, and civil rights icon. Next characteristic is that of liberation or freedom thinking. And this was done by we went all the way to the other side to Leo Watson, an, an Aboriginal Austri Australian artist and activist. And she simply says, if you've come to help me, you're wasting your time. If you have come because your liberation 
is bound up with mine, then let's work together. Let me repeat that because some of you may really need to think about this. If you have come to help me, you're wasting your time. If you have come because your liberation, regardless of what that liberation is, is bound up with mine, then let's work together. Then I want to focus on one we just passed through the, the season of celebrating Kwanzaa, at least some of us. Ujima, which means collective work and responsibility. And it simply says to build and maintain our communities and solve our problems together by taking ownership of each other's problems. Let me repeat that. To build, it encourages us to build and maintain our communities and solve our problems together by taking ownership of each other's problems. And we've had some variations of this who said, um, no man is an island, or I am the, um, because we are which captures the same sentiments, but we're talking about Mulana um, Karenga, who's um, Dr. Mulana Karenga, an American activist, author, and professor of Africana studies. Last, the last characteristic that I want to share with you, and this is not the only one because this list is not um, exhaustive by any means, but I wanted to highlight a variety of characteristics that I think um, are important for us as we think about resilience. But this last one is courage. And this author, who unfortunately is no longer with us, says courage is the most important of all virtues because without courage, you can't practice any other virtue consistently. Let me be courageous and repeat this. Courage is the most important of all virtues because without courage, you can't practice any other virtue consistently. And this is it was said by none other than Maya Angelou, American memorist, celebrated poet, and civil rights activist. If anyone within the sound of my voice still questions why we should celebrate Black History Month. Consider this quote from Dr. Philip S. S. Howard, Assistant Professor in the Department of Integrated Studies at McGill University. He speaks to the fact that Black history celebrates the incredible persistence of Black people in the face of ongoing persecution. He asserts that Black History Month is an important opportunity for celebration, affirmation, and focused attention within Black communities that are doing the daily work of asserting our humanity. I will end as I began with a poem and both poems that were original pieces. This one simply says, beauty emerges from the shadows with the dawning of a new day. Beat down, but not defeated. Flames towering the overheated, yet out of the ashes seemingly singed, emerges the people truly unhinged. Resilient, joyous, freedom's face becomes colored, mirroring a legacy of courage and strength. No apology is my anthology of truth, for I am married to an ancestral past that finds its home within my soul. I am a part of a past that has risen, risen from the ashes, still finding joy through all of its pain.
ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you for allowing me this opportunity to share with you that my understanding of resilient joy. And I trust that um, you would have found or you would have heard something that would have at least spoken to your spirit this morning. Dr. Thank Savoy. You, thank you so much. I really appreciate that. I want to definitely um, open the floor now to if there's any questions. I thought I saw a few hands. there any questions? The, the provost has a question. Okay. Yes. First of all, I want to say thank you uh, for your for your insightfulness and for your lecture on this morning. And I have a question about uh, more so Carter G. Woodson and his 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 uh, text, the miseducation of the Negro mm -hmm. in particular, and how this notion of joyous resiliency communicates with this notion of education and the systemic racism that was implied by the miseducation of the Negro and how we can move beyond or into this space of joyous resiliency when there are these antagonistic systems that pretty much Carter G. Wilson is recognizing are not necessarily just to attack those oppressed people of color, but any oppressed uh, entity. So how do we address and, and contain or um, how do we uh, ensure this notion of joyous resiliency in the midst of systemic uh, instances of racism, in particular dealing with education? Yes, I told the provost not to ask any difficult questions, but you would know the first one that she would come up with would be a challenging complex. But the whole notion is how do we continue to address the issue of joyous resilience in the face of all of these systemic, re um, um, you know, resistance, as particularly as it relates to um, education. Well, I will attempt to share, or I will share my interpretation of what I think is a, a solution. No, I like the part that I shared when um, Carter G. Woodson talked about um, elevating um, excellence, uh, to studying it and elevating excellence. And if I am allowed to share with you an experience that I had at the university when I was a faculty member, a young faculty member in my early 30s, right, at the University of a southern university, let me just leave it, at a, at a southern university. And I remember that we were in this space where these students were all, a lot of these black students were coming into my office and they were complaining about how they feel stifled in the classroom, that they cannot be themselves. And they feel that the, um, the professors, most of whom were um, white, um, were somewhat looking down on or not valuing what they said um, a whole lot. And so they felt even in the wider color space that they didn't have a supportive um, environment. And I said myself and three other black faculty who were there at that time said, OK, let's there's, there are quite a few of you. Why you don't come together and form an association, right? A support system so you'd have your own support system. Well, some of them would say, can we do that? They were, they didn't think that they could um, come together, right, and, and do that. But as they started to come together and try and started to plan, then some of the white faculty members said, why are you doing that? It's divisive. Why don't you be a part of the larger student organization rather than forming this black student org organization? The students were getting excited about forming their their um, organization, but yet there was that entity that was telling them, OK, you, you don't need to do that. And then I had to have a conversation with them. I said, this group is about celebrating you, celebrating your excellence. It's not about putting down anyone else, but it's celebrating your rich history. And I said to them, if any of my colleagues come to you with those questions or statements again, 
Tell them Dr. Bolden said that those questions should be directed to him. <laughs> so several of us who are enlightened and uh, have the courage of which I spoke need to step in and fill the gap for some of those who are not sufficiently enlightened to appropriately respond in those spaces. And so we, you know, we are getting a lot of challenges to talking about the past in our schools. But as I am shared, and as I assume that if Carter G. Woodson was still alive, he would say, um, okay, is the past truly the past if it still lingers in the present? Right? And so not talking about an issue doesn't automatically make it go. So creating space safe spaces, brave spaces, so those who are challenged in such a way can express themselves and those of us who are champions and have the courage and can afford to risk some of the full professors, some of the more senior ones, then you can um, step in and help out with that. But the reality is that not talking about what happened, right, does not um, make things disappear. And you need to tell people when they said, okay, well, why don't you pull yourself up by your own bootstrap? Try pulling up yourself by your bootstrap and see what happens. And the reality is that uh, many of those folks who tell you that didn't pull themselves up by their own bootstrap. So there's some atrocities in the past that still um, resonates powerfully in the present. And, and being silent doesn't make them go away. Thank you You're so welcome. much for that. We have a question from Michael Bowden. Okay, the, the, these are um, my colleagues in the yeah. academic. Oh, <laughs> yes. Academic affairs are coming. Come on, come on. Come on, I'm here, BP. Come on. Can you hear me? Yes, yes sir. Yes, can. Okay, great. Well, thank you. Um, Dr. Bowden, again, thank you for really just taking this project on and just offering this lecture to us. Um, especially in this environment in which we're currently in. I must admit, I was sitting here at my desk trying to multitask and get it all in, but I had to just stop and drop everything and just really pay attention to you because I'm I'm feeling proud. Um, and so I make that uh, that prefaced comment to, to ask you the following question. What do you think that um, Carter G. Woodson would say if he was here with us today about why it's important to continue celebrating our history, you know, our ancestors and their accomplishments and why that is not a separatist separatist activity. Right, I, I can build upon the comment that I, I made um, earlier, right? Mm -hmm. No, you do not have to put down another person or group of individuals to elevate yourself. If you are doing that, right? If you are preoccupied with that, you are giving um, another group or another um, school of thought a lot of energy. You're taken away from what you should be celebrating, right? You heard people say, don't let anyone steal your joy, right? Yeah. And I think he would, he would say, look, then I say to focus on studying history, which history tells us a lot about um, not only what we confronted, but how we made it over. And now that we are on a journey where we realize in a more powerful way that we can, and we've had so many examples of things that we have achieved, why are we not spending more time celebrating the excellence amongst us, right? So that the younger um, folks, or those who we are mentoring, can see black excellence, in real terms, right? Because let me suggest to you that there are a lot of folks, not only in the United States, but globally, that are still not fully aware how tremendous we are as a people and how many things that we have achieved, how many things, how many lives would have been um, less um, joyous if they were not for some of the accomplishments, some of the inventions of us, and I say us, I mean black folks, universally. 
So I think he would push us more to um, focus on elevating, understanding the history, right? And to also take charge of our narrative because to, there are too many people who are controlling our narrative, right? And there's folks again who like to take a single story, right? And let that single story um, determine what our um, narrative um, is. So I think he would encourage us um, to do some of those things and obviously much more. But from my limited understanding, because I'm still a student of history, and as long as I I'm alive, I will continue um, to study. But I think he would say, OK, stop giving so much energy to the naysayers and focus on celebrating what we have achieved and what we could achieve. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. We have another question from Mike Bailey. Mike Bailey, your mic is on mute. Okay, here you go. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. How you doing, doctor? Um, good afternoon, fine. I had a question because I think it kind of starts with a statement more and then leads to a question. One, I can appreciate what you were saying, um, how you responded to the question that was asked um, about, I think as the individual recognizing if you are not, if you are not equipped with the information or enlightenment, as you said, to respond accordingly. Um, and I think that puts the onus on the person with the challenge to seek out uh, those that have the experience and that are able to help support you in what you are up against. And then my question would be, um, because there are a lot of gurus out there in different spaces. Um, is there any recommendation on the due diligence that you should should do in order to make sure that you know you're you're truly working with somebody who has the the experience and the intellect and the, and the education to be able to back your cause? Yes, I'll share a few things. First of all, I wish I didn't have to say this, but because someone is black doesn't mean they have your back. Number one. Right. Um, two, right. Education is not limited to book knowledge, right? And sometimes, or hero status, because sometimes there there are a lot of there's still some educated fools, right? Just because I am good at some kind of sport or I'm an entertainer, right? That does not act automatically make me a griot, right? Or someone that um, you should um, listen to. I encourage folks to do your, um, your homework. Engage in fact checking because there are some gurus and some who fall under the umbrella of Pan-Africanism, right? that would say some things that if you fact checked, you would realize that it is not exactly accurate. Now, so you have to be a student, not only of history, but to do some homework and check and double check, right? To see if what you are being told is, is um, in fact accurate. But there are some folks out there, um, and I, one of the things you could do is, is trust some of these organizations who have vetted folks, right? But even, even within that space, still do your homework, right? Be, and, and, and understand what are the sources of their information. There's some who would report um, that they're experts on the African continent. And when you try to check out the source of that information, you may be shocked. There are some 
who may have just visited the, um, the continent one time, one country, and then return as experts on African culture, not realizing that, first of all, Africa is a continent with a plethora of cultures, right? Even as you talk about Blacks in America, we are very diverse. We are from the Caribbean, as I am. We are from the, um, the continent. We are in Europe. We are in South America. And so we are influenced by our upbringing. When I came here to the United States and I went to, the, um, the, to Idaho, there are certain ways I operated that some of the Black Americans looked at me and said, OK, are you going to do that? In other words, I was not staying in my place. Well, I didn't know where my place was because I grew up in an environment where I said, if you wanted to do something, to so just go ahead and do it. So sometimes what we share is based on our background. So our knowledge is still limited. So don't think that any one single story, as I said earlier, should in totality determine the narrative. But you got to find out what exactly are you trying to find out, right? What exactly are you seeking, right? And understand what might have worked in past times or what may have been relevant in past times may no longer be relevant in the same way in the present. So the, uh, the response to that is a complex one. There's so many layers um, to it that it would, that's a perfect um, question for, um, a fireside chat with folks from different disciplines, different walks of life, um, different um, age um, ranges. But I said, keep on um, doing your uh, individual work and keep on um, searching and searching and searching for, um, for knowledge. I hope that answers your question. Thank you, it does. Thank you for that. Um, and one of the things you said to the fireside chats, and I think maybe that's something that we need to look in because you also mentioned about safe spaces. And so one of the things that we know that we're constantly fighting for humanity, equality and dignity and respect. And what we do, do is sometimes often hone in on our identity and feel like that is our safe space, you know, by being around people of color. But one of the things is when we talk about safe spaces, a lot of times people of color often don't have access to safe spaces, particularly in their community. So what do you recommend a safe, how can we create a safe space? How do we start that process of creating safe spaces? What should be considered in our safe space? Um the opportunity for folks to disagree with you and the opportunity for you to disagree with them and not and not feel attacked, right? There is a concept that I learned, I think, in undergrad, and so I, I hope um, recall bias wouldn't set in here, but it, 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 it is a concept of groupthink. And so we're a group of individuals because of some common identity that they share, think that the way they, um, and I psychologist in the room, so I'm going to look to um, her reaction to see if I'm uh, misrepresenting it. But they're thinking that the what they are advancing is the gospel truth. And any introduction to something that may challenge that is met with a lot of resistance, right? So first of all, if you're in a space and that is happening, you have to realize that that's not a safe space. And so we as, a, for instance, we as educators in our classrooms must create safe spaces for our students to express themselves, whether we agree with them or not, and whether if they are wrong, because our job is to operate as an educator. And so how we could fully um, correct uh, misinformation 
right? If we do not know what they're thinking. So we must create those safe and brave spaces that it doesn't matter if you are doctor this or doctor that. If you are assistant professor or you are full professor, if you are the provost or president or whatever, create um, spaces, those brave spaces where you can know what the persons you are trying to influence actually think and be open to the being proven that you could very well be wrong or that your way of thinking could be somewhat archaic right and um, be and be open to change but if you are so rigid and you don't want to be open to um to change that is not um the safest of spaces um at all and so creating a space safe, um, safe space, I would suggest to you, requires us to engage in some self-examination as well, and to see which, what isms might um, come into our environment. And there is this other thing that I'm still trying to study some more about, this whole thing of intersectionality. We have to realize that because we uh, may be all black, all Black Americans, all Black Caribbeans. There's so many other intersections that make up our identity that sometimes may produce some friction. But the safe space would allow those different intersections to emerge. And that whole thing about self-love that I, I'm referencing my presentation, would be something that could be more easily um, celebrated. But remember, a safe spray, space is more is easier to talk about than to actually do, because we have to be prepared sometimes to say, ouch, because our toes may be stepped upon. Thank you. You're welcome. Do we, do we have any more questions in the audience and online? If not, I want to thank you, Dr. Bolden, for a powerful, culturally affirming lecture. I am aware that in the midst of these unprecedented times, I know we are all searching for that joy, hope, inspiration, and ways to even nurture ourselves amidst our own personal activism. And your lecture was inspiring and engaging, and it engaged us all in what it means to be alive and thrive and find strength in our own vulnerability. So again, I want to thank you for encouraging us to live a life of joy and affirmation. We must practice, encourage, and continue our celebration in Black History Month and I want to encourage you all that we can continue to celebrate in Black History Month by going on to the Coppin Black History Month page for our next coming events. This Friday, we will have Dr. Jarvis Garvey, the son of Marcus Garvey, at Coppin State University this Friday, February 3rd at 6 o'clock in the atrium of the Talon Building. We look forward to seeing you there, and you can go ahead and RSVP to that event. Again, thank you, Dr. Bolden. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, and this concludes the program.